Jorgowski, and I'm a senior software engineer with uh, Spring Source VMware and one of the developers of the um, ever popular Spring Integration Framework, uh, which is an enterprise integration and messaging framework brought to you by uh, Spring. So uh, I'm also a lead developer for Spring Integration Scala DSL, so for those of you who are interested in Scala and Spring Integration, uh, there is a lot of cool things coming your way, but we'll talk about it some other time. Uh, today's webinar is based on the Spring One talk I've delivered last year, which became rather popular, so um, we decided to make a webinar out of it. Um, so we're going to be talking about practical tips and tricks, as well as the advanced techniques you can apply using Spring Integration to accomplish various use cases. Um, it is important to understand that this talk is tailored to the users who um, are already familiar with Spring Integration. It is not an introductory talk about uh, Spring Integration. If you are new to Spring Integration, I would suggest um, to first watch the webinar recording delivered by Mark Fisher, who is uh, the creator and the project lead for Spring Integration, and then watch this webinar uh, since it's been recorded as well and will be available on Spring Source YouTube channel and springsource.org. Um, Today is part one of this part, uh, of this practical tips and tricks, and of course I'd expect you to join me in a few weeks for part two, uh, where we'll be discussing even more uh, advanced techniques. Um, but today's agenda is mainly around the area of error handling when it comes to uh, messaging. So um, let's begin. So here's uh, you probably can see the agenda right now. So we're going to be talking about uh, a plain, you know, very simple error handling, and then we're going to be talking about message flow partitioning, message flows with retry. These are all cases that have to do with error handling. And then we're going to talk about controlling the expectations with timeouts, and uh, we're also going to talk about uh, custom message, message ID generation. All right, so uh, let's begin. I'm going to switch to the code, and from this point on, it's going to be, it's going to be nothing but code. Um, okay, so... Um, Messaging system, just like any other systems, can produce error. We all know that. Um, and very often, handling such errors might itself need to be a process which um, relies on messaging. Uh, the first sample demonstrates exactly that by allowing the definition of the error channel by the components that serve as an entry point into a messaging flow. As we know, these components are inbound adapters and gateways. Before we get into all these details um, and the demo part, it's important to understand the distinction between the components that serve as an entry point into a messaging flow versus components that serve as a message flow handlers, such as service activators, transformers, filters, and so on. Uh, the question that is often asked is, why isn't there an error channel attribute on a service activator or filter or transformer? So, and to answer this question, I'll I usually use try-catch analogy where um, a messaging flow represented as a block of code encapsulated by a try-catch block where try serves as an entry point into this block of code and each line of code within the try-catch block is analogous to a message handler such as transformers, filter, or service activator. So exception could happen anywhere in your code, but once it happens, the try component will delegate its handling to the catch block. if one provided, right? So uh, in this case, catch is an error channel. Uh, now imagine our code, how, now imagine how our code would look like if the imaginary component representing the line of code where the exception happened would have its own you know, error handling logic. It wouldn't be pretty. So uh, essentially the component that serves as an entry point into a messaging flow also serves as a component that identifies the boundaries or scope of this messaging flow. But just like in code, you know, in, in code we can have many different try and catch blocks. They can be nested, they could be followed one after another sequentially. Um, we can have um, uh, we can have the same requirements in the messaging flow, right? So, and uh, later on, we're actually going to talk about how to partition your message flow, how to segment your message flow to um, accomplish the same goal. But right now, let's get to our sample. So, um, here's our first configuration. Actually, this is not our first configuration, but this, uh, here we go. Here's our first configuration, right? Um, 
And in this configuration, as you can see, we have a messaging gateway, which is our error, error, um, error demo gateway. And um, when we send the message, when we call uh, invoke the method on this gateway, the gateway is going to send the message to the input channel. And the input channel is a splitter, right? It's going to split the message and send it to a processing channel. From processing channel, the message is going to be uh, uh, processed by filter, and the filter is going to basically validate if the message's payload length is greater than four. If it is, it's going to allow it to proceed. If not, it's going to raise an exception because I'm using throw exception and rejection uh, true. So, and then it's going to go to logging channel, which is basically logging channel adapter. In fact, we don't even need an explicit channel here. We can just do this. And we can delete this. The channel will be, as you know, auto-created, right? So, and logging channel adapter is going to log it, right? So, right now, our gateway does not define any error channel. And um, we're going to execute our code. And we see exception that the message filter rejected the message, right? But exception was actually caught, I mean, thrown into uh, our code. So in other words, that's me, the caller. This is, this is where exception was actually thrown, when I said gateway process. That's the code that caught exception or actually resulted in exception. So if it was the real code, I would have to deal with that, right? Well, I don't want to deal with that. I want my messaging flow to let me know gracefully that I have an error, pro an error condition, right? So what will I do? Well, I'm going to define an error channel. and point it to this process error channel, right? So right now it's going to go to process. So in other words, right now when exception happens and the gateway sees that the error channel was explicitly defined, what it's going to do is going to send that error, uh, error message to the error channel and basically give you one less chance to um, see if you can fix the error, right, or do something about it, right? So, and uh, in my transformer that is subscribed to error channel, I'm simply going to wrap the payload of the original message in the hashtags, just to signify that this message, uh, just to mark that this message uh, was at error. So let's try to um, run this code again. Of course, I never saved the file, so let's try to do it again. And right now we see two messages that came in. Um, so one was processed successfully, and a buy message was processed unsuccessfully. So let's look at the actual code that uh, executes this thing. So we um, got the gateway from um, the application context, and then we sent an array of two strings, one that says um, uh, has three characters, another one that has four, five characters. So and uh, which means that one passed the condition, one didn't. So, <clears throat> so this is pretty much the end of the first sample. And in a second, you'll understand why I'm kind of uh, sort of restating the obvious uh, when it comes to the error channel. So, because we get, we, every example after that is going to basically expand on uh, on the other one. So, um, right now we're actually going to stay on the same uh, in, on the same demo, but in a different variation of it. So. I'm going to open up this file. In this file, we are actually using um, aggregator, right? So, um, in fact, the interesting thing is, is that I'm going to be sending the same payload, but the flow actually changed a little bit. So um, everything goes the same up until it hits the filter. After the filter, we're actually introducing the aggregator, right? And um, what's going to happen here is that um, if the um, <coughs> I'm sorry. So, um, so um, one second. Um, because enterprise integration patterns identify several components that are stateful in nature and may um, may depend on a predetermined amount of message coming in before some action would be taken. So, for example, you may actually have a flow that, um, like like in this particular flow, we have an aggregator uh, which expects, uh, let's say, three messages. In this case, it's going to be two messages. Um, but if upstream processing of one of the messages resulted in error, such, such messages will, um, will never reach the aggregator, and the aggregator will never release the other set of messages. However, by handling the error via messaging flow, you can actually send uh, the error message 
or some message describing the error to that aggregator, thus satisfying uh, its requirements. So, for example, since we know what's going to happen, we know that when we send the message, the message is going to be split, and the filter is going to be receiving two messages, uh, which um, have to be aggregated later on. And um, the one message is going to pass the filtering criteria, while another message will not. And that means that aggregator is going to be holding on to one message, waiting for another one, which will never come. Right? So, uh, and actually, I'm going to demonstrate it before I'll fix it. So let's run the error demo again. Oops, I have to change. Uh, so we're going to be bootstrapping our uh, demo with a different application context. So right, so our process is still running. Uh, we still got our message, uh, you know, message filter rejection exception, right? And uh, right now, what I'm going to show you is through the J console that our aggregator actually only processed uh, one. Um, Our aggregator only processed um, one message and waiting for another one, but that one will never come. So if we go to MBeans, and this is, again, using Spring Integration JMX support, which um, we're actually going to cover in a webinar in about a month by Gary Russell, one of the developers of Spring Integration. But right now, I'll give you kind of a quick preview. So I'm going to Message Handlers, and here's our aggregator. And when I go to its attributes, you can see that the handle count is set to one because it only received and processed and handled basically one message, but the second message will never come. So um, let's fix it. And we're going to fix it by um, identifying error channel. Actually, it's right here. Right, and um, So right now, as you can see, we got a single log message of aggregated message, which contains hello and bye, but bye is wrapped in a hashtag, which means that message was came as part of the error handling logic, but at least it satisfied our um, aggregator's contract. So that this question is actually asked quite often because you can imagine how uh, often this condition might happen in situations where your message flow has some type of a fork um, uh, happening in, in downstream, so you, 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 you're sending one message, you might split it, or you might have, you know, a subscribe channel or um, recipient list router, which allows, you know, single message to be processed by multiple um, uh, processors, and eventually you won't aggregate the responses um, from that message, but if one processor fails, then all of a sudden the aggregator doesn't know what to do about the messages that it holds. All right, so that's pretty much the end of the error handling demo. And uh, right now we're going to move to another topic, which is the uh, flow segmentation and flow partitioning. And um, so um, <clears throat> using the, uh, the same, uh, same try-catch analogy, let's look at the um, slightly, dif slightly different error handling requirement. So depending on the handler that generated the exception, or that resulted in exception, you may not want for this exception to propagate back to the original entry point of the entire flow. So using try-catch analogy, it's, it's as if you want to wrap part of the flow downstream in its own try-and-catch block. So basically, uh, you want to create an independent flow partition or segment. And to do this, um, we'll use a technique that allows you to introduce sort of a sub-entry point within an existing messaging flow. Uh, we do this by introducing a messaging gateway downstream, which is invoked by a service activator. So let's look at how do we do that. Um, so we do it actually quite simply. So again, we have um, a gateway, just like we had before. Uh, we already have another channel defined here. And this gateway uh, identifies a default request channel, which is segment one channel. And uh, as you can see, segment one channel is pointing, uh, basically has a subscriber called, um, which is this service activator. 
And uh, this service activator is going to be um, basically bootstrapped with the reference of this bean by the name segment one. Well, segment, segment one actually is another gateway that's defined downstream. So the only difference here is you can see that this gateway does not identify a service interface because it's no longer, no, no longer needed because it's bootstrapped with the default interface, right? So um, now what happens here is that once the uh, service activator invokes this gateway, it's as if somebody else invoked the gateway and entered a, a sort of a, a sub-partition or, or, or another messaging flow. But that, this another messaging flow is actually sitting within some parent messaging flow, right? So in other words, right now we have a service activator which is being invoked by this gateway. And um, the service activator um, may or may not result in exception. But if, if it does result in exception, this exception is going to be handled by this error channel, not this error channel, right? Actually, it's the same channel, but... Uh, you'll see it uh, later on a bit of a different configuration, right? So if it does proceed, it goes to, um, to segment two and the configuration looks identical, but we can see that if error occurs within this service activator, it's actually gonna be handled by S2 error channel, not S1 error channel. And the same happens for segment three, right? So um, that's how it looks. And actually, it's quite interesting to envision um, this particular configuration in uh, visualization diagram. Um, so, for example, here's our main gateway. We begin, and here's a segment one. We begin, and here's a segment two, and here's a segment three, right? And you can see that each segment defines a flow and an error flow, right? So it's kind of a neat thing to see how it actually works. So um, with that, let's try to execute the code. Um, so as you can see, everything is pretty simple here. We're just going to get the gateway out of the application context, and we're going to... Um, and a, in, basically invoke a gateway method with an integer number. And basically what's, what we expect to happen is that, for example, in the first time, we're going to see if, if it's divisible by 5, it, it is. If it's divisible by 2, it is. If it's divisible by 3, and so on. So um, <clears throat> let's execute it. And depending on where we are, wh which number we're sending, uh, something's going to generate a, um, an exception. We'll see based on, actually, I didn't show you that part, but based on where, which segment exception had occurred, uh, the message is going to be, the resulting payload is going to be wrapped in a single hash if it's in the first segment, uh, double hash if it's in the second segment, and so on. So let's run it. Um. So it completed successfully because that's the number that actually works, right? But let's say we're going to do um, 11, right? And uh, when we execute it with 11, we're actually going to see that there's a failure, and it happened in the first segment, right? So if we try to change this number to, let's say, 15, and run it again, now we can say that the error still happened, but it happened in the second segment, right? Because that's where it's been handled, and uh, we know that. And, um, you know, let's try one more time with 20. And... Um, And you can see that it happened in the, in the third um, flow. All right, so that's, um, in the next example, you'll see why this particular part is important. But you can also see that even without anything else, it's a pretty interesting technique that allows you to sort of say, listen, I don't want to propagate my exception all the way up to the stack. Up the stack, if my exception happens somewhere, like almost at the end of the flow, I kind of want to create a little partition, handle it there, and don't worry about other components to uh, know that the error happened. All right. So with that, I'm moving on to probably the most interesting sample and kind of one of the most requested sort of a, or most asked questions on the forum is, how can we do a retry? How can we, you know, have um, build a spring integration flow that allows you, you know, if something happened, allows you to retry it. So, um, so let's do this. So my messaging flow resulted in error, um, but I know how to fix it, and I did fix it, and um, I did fix it in the error flow, and I would like to retry this message flow again. And if another error occurs, um, I want to have a chance to try to fix it again and retry it again and so on. So in other words, I want to have some kind of a um, self-healing process. I want to be able to build some type of a self-healing process. 
So in this example, we are using Custom Service Activator, which uh, basically uppercase is a payload, but only uh, payload is a string. So, but only if the payload, uh, if the if, if the value of the payload is greater than four characters. If it's not, it raises an exception. Um, of course, this could be easily accomplished with um, spell-based filter and transform repair, but I just wanted to log a custom message, you know, and um, on each retry, while well, also kind of remind you that, you know, even though all these all these samples are built uh, using spell, you know, uh, in more more realistic scenarios, you can freely use plain old Java objects and implement those processes uh, using Java. So let's go and retry. So uh, first, let's look at the actual uh, our, our class that's going to be uh, backing up the service activator, right? So this is this is our upper caser. So it's gonna there's a method to upper case, and it's going to receive the payload, and then you're going to see the message saying I'm attempting to upper case this value, and if this value is greater than um, four, then it's going to uh, return it. Uh, if it's not, you'll see the message I'm retrying it, and it's basically throwing an exception, right? Now. And that's it, that's all it does. Um, now let's look at the configuration. So what we have here is, again, everything looks very similar. So we have uh, the main gateway, that's our entry point into our entire messaging flow. Then we have a service activator, which itself invokes a gateway, right? And this gateway actually defines an error channel. And uh, this gateway will uh, be sending a message to um, default request channel, which is a processing channel, and the processing channel is this input channel for this service activator. And uh, that's where, that's where our, which is bootstrap with our upper caser, right? And we know that this flow will return if successfully, if the string that we're going to send is over four characters, but if it's not, it's going to raise an exception. Now, if the exception is going to be raised here, it's going to be basically caught and handled by this gateway, not that gateway, because in this gateway, this gateway will delegate it to this retry channel. So retry channel is actually, um, it has a, a, a message handler uh, subscribed to it, which actually is another enterprise integration component called delayer. And the delayer will simply, I just wanted to make it a little more interesting. I didn't really need the delayer here, but you know. Um, so this delayer will simply delay the retry for one second and um, will send it to transformer. And transformer, so basically I'm, I'm trying to fix the, 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 the message, right? So this transformer is going to be basically padding the string the, that it receives with an extra space, right? And as soon as it pads the string, this string with an extra space, it's going to send that resulting message back to the input channel. So it comes back all around to here, uh, to this service activator. And as we already know, this service activator invokes this gateway and the process sort of repeats itself. So essentially creating this loop um, which, uh, based on, on uh, the process that will change um, what we are evaluating, will actually end at some point of time. But it's going to keep retrying until it ends. And again, you can build your own process. So I just wanted to make this one a little more interesting where I can actually retry several times. And I know that with each retry, I'm moving closer to fixing this message. Right? Uh, one thing I want to point out really quickly is that, um, you know, default delay one, uh, basically to one second, right? But uh, I just want to make sure you guys understand, we are not really sleeping for one second. We're not really just posing, posing the threat for one second. Uh, we don't do that. We actually, um, the way the delayer works, as you can see, there is, it's uh, configured with a scheduler component. And so what we do, we're actually saying, as soon as the delayer gets the message, all it does, it schedules for, it schedules, for, uh, it delegates to task executor to schedule something to, to be started at a certain point of time. So basically, it does system quarantine mail list plus one second and say start it at that time. So there's no threat that sleep um, in the delayer component. Anyway, so let's go to retry demo and try to execute it. So we're sending um, a single uh, character string and uh, we're expecting the reply to come in. So in other words, we're actually not wrapping this gateway and trying catch block. We always expect a successful reply, which might describe the error condition or might actually be a true success. But, you know, from the gateway perspective, it's going to be, it's always going to be a success. So let's run it. I'll just let it run through and then I'll scroll through the log. So, um, so as you can see, I mean, we have this 
stack traces, but uh, we can see our messages coming from our um, uh, upper case, so it attempts to upper case um, this value. It can because it's only two characters long, then it's three characters long, then it's four characters long, and so on and so forth until you get to the point where you know it's five characters and finally it exited successfully because it fixed the string and said, listen, it's not four characters, but now it, now it is. Or, I mean, sorry, five characters. All right? So, um, and as you can see, if I, for example, um, if I send a string that contains um, four characters and try to run again, we're only going to have, instead of four retries, we're actually going to have only one retry. And it fixed it, right? And uh, if I send it with the five uh, characters, it's supposed to satisfy condition right away. That's it. So in other words, you can see how, for example, this particular process, if condition is satisfied, then everything is fine. If it's not, you can build the process that attempts to fix, uh, you know, what you're sending and, uh, and um, guarantee, almost create a, this, uh, guarantee you a, kind of an always success uh, story for your application. Okay. Um, so that kind of um, covers all these um, error handling conditions. But right now we kind of, you know, talked a lot about these gateways. And um, what I want to talk about right now is how can you manage expectations? Uh, how can you control expectations? Because when it comes to messaging, uh, you know, when, when, you, when you call a, a Java method, I mean, you typically expect that if you call it, you're going to get a reply. I mean. And if it's a blocking method, at least you hope that it's documented and you know how to deal with that. But with messaging flow, it's actually not as simple because messaging flow, you you know, you you can build a flow that today's today you know today guarantees your reply, but tomorrow something might happen internally and reply might not come. So how do you deal with that? So um, so in other words, we uh, up until now we kind of looked at unidirectional flows, which are uh, the message flows that do not produce any reply. But right now, um, we're going to be talking about bidirectional flows. And um, uh, when assembling flows, there are certain, uh, when assembling such messaging flows, there are certain things you kind of need to be aware of. So uh, messaging systems are essentially an event-driven systems. And although you expect an event, such event uh, may not ever happen, or it may not happen in a predefined period of time. So um, the reason why it's so important to understand is because the components that you use to interact with a messaging system may also be the components that will be responsible to gather a reply data to return back to you. So these components, we call them uh, inbound gateways. So remember, we have um, inbound gateways and we have, we have gateways and adapters. Gateways are bidirectional, adapters are unidirectional. That's the main difference. So, and in this particular case, we're talking about inbound gateways. That's the gateways that um, allow you to interact with messaging system, but they also produce a reply. So um, um, this means that uh, when you create a gateway, you're essentially creating a component that um, that will register a subscriber to a reply channel that's auto-created by the gateway. Um, and the gateway will not produce a reply back to you until that reply is given to it by that uh, message handler, that gateway, basically that subscriber, that gateway registered on your behalf. But what if for some reason the message will never come to the reply channel? Um, in this case, the gateway will block indefinitely. Uh, in, the most case, in most cases, I assume that is not what you guys expect and what you're looking for. And therefore, you need to be able to manage how long are you willing to wait for a reply before you and kind of exit. You don't want to sit there forever and wait for it. So, um, you do so using the default reply timeout attribute um, of the gateway. So let's look at it. Uh, there we go. So here's our configuration, right? And uh, let's look at this flow and let's let's see what what's happening here. Uh, actually, we have to look at the gateway uh, interface as well. So if we look at the gateway interface, we see that the gateway interface um, defines a method called echo, which has a signature with, uh, that returns a string. It's non-void method. So, so by definition, this is going to be an inbound gateway that actually produces a reply, right? And um, when we interact with this gateway, we're going to send a message. To, we're going to send a message to this router, right? And the router is going to route if the uh, value of the payload is foo, 
then um, it's going to send it to foo channel, and the value of the payload is bar, it's going to send it to bar channel. But the interesting thing here is that the foo channel actually uppercases the string, and basically the message will be sent back to the reply channel that comes with message headers, right? However, the, foo, the bar channel is actually pointing to the logging channel adapter, and this is a channel adapter which, as I just said, will log a message but will not produce any type of output. So what happens, you created a gateway you know, that expects to reply, but the reply will not come for a certain condition. Okay? So uh, let's see how that actually happens. So we see reply. That comes from this line of code. We see logging handler logging the bar. That comes from um, this I mean, so logging channel adapter. But we don't see an output coming from this line. And we see that our process is still holding on to something, right? We're, we're actually blocking right here. We're waiting. So, um, and we'd be sitting here waiting indefinitely for this to um, return reply, and the reply is actually not coming at all, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, default uh, reply timeout, and I'm going to give it two seconds, for example, right? So now I'm saying whatever I sent you, if you cannot produce a reply within two seconds, don't bother, right? So and there we go. So now we have uh, our first reply. We got you know in the console we see the log logging handler did get ex executed. We saw a little bit of a pause for two seconds, and finally we basically received a reply from the gateway saying that nothing came back. Okay, so that's um, actually very important because a lot of times when you um, dealing with messaging system, these conditions can occur dynamically. So when you're creating an inbound gateways like this, always ask yourself a question. Um, can you possibly guarantee that, re is your, can your system guarantee that reply will always come? Because if there's even remote uh, possibility that it might not, I would suggest always define, actually says, I would suggest to always define some type of a reasonable um, reply timeout, okay? All right. So, and um, this is pretty much actually ends uh, all the demos that are related um, to the error handling. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one more demo, which is kind of unrelated to this whole topic. But uh, I just want to, this particular one is not unrelated to anything. So I just wanted to uh, make sure that I get it out of the way because um, it's more of an awareness kind of demo where um, we've been asked this question many times, but uh, it's kind of a corner case. but I'm sure that uh, some of you may have encountered this case, and uh, you would you, you would like to know that this this capability exists. Okay, and then I'm going to turn over to um, questions and answers. So uh, what we're going to talk about right now is the uh, message ID. So um, each message ID, um, each message, each each message has an ID header, which we all know uh, is a UUID. And we're using UUID, random UUID method, to generate um, message ID um, because it, you know, it guarantees globally unique message ID um, for us. And that's kind of important for us because as a, at the framework level, we have to really address it from the most conservative um, approach that we could possibly do. However, um, <clears throat> um, even though it does guarantee global unique message ID, um, it, has a slightly it has a slight performance cost which is only visible in systems with extremely high throughput, right? So in other words, um, don't just be, you know, you heard, you heard the word performance and you're like, okay, and we can't use it or whatever. No, it's only most of us, in fact, 99% of us will probably never notice it and we probably would never be affected by that. But it's only for the systems, you know, that have extremely high throughput. And again, the only way for you to know is to do benchmarks, your own benchmarks. So, but the question is, can, um, can we actually you know, override default IG generation logic, right? And the answer is yes, we can now. Uh, I don't want to sound like Obama, but you know, we can. So let's uh, see how it's actually done. Um, where is that sample? So it's actually the, probably the most simple um, example of them all. So um, all you need to do to override um, message ID is to um, 
to register a bean which implements um, a ID generator interface. An ID generator interface is, is simply has one method called generate ID and returns you your ID. So however, however you want to generate that ID, you um, generate it and return it. All you need to do is simply um, register it as a bean, and that's it. You don't actually not even need, well, yeah, you don't even need this ID actually here. So you just simply need to register it as a bean. Okay, so um, as soon as you register it, every time you execute uh, you know, any, 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 anything within a JVM will execute the um, new generic message, whatever, um, you're actually going to see that it's going to be using your ID generator instead of the one that uh, we are using. So um, let's run this code. And you can see that it's coming, this, this, this log statement coming from our class telling you that we are generating an ID instead of, um, if I remove it, you know, everything will still work the same way. Right, but we're not going to see that message because the ID is going to be generated by a different, basically by the internal component within Spring Integration. Okay, so um, this uh, concludes this first part of uh, practical tips and tricks, and I'm going to um, turn it over and start. As uh, I see you guys already asking me questions, so I'm basically right now we're in the Q&A session. In the flow segmentation example, would it be possible or desirable to put each segment in the chain for clarity? Um, that's actually a great question, uh, and especially the way you ask it, you say, uh, in the chain for clarity. I'm not a big fan of chains, personally. It's just my personal preference, so for me, I would, I would not uh, say it's a clarity, uh, but yes, it would be, you know, if, if for you it's, it's more clear, why not? It's absolutely possible, yes. Which tools you use to see the graph details? That's a good question. Uh, so uh, I'm using Spring Source Tool Suite, which is um, Eclipse-based, um, well, Eclipse-based Spring development environment. And uh, if you download STS, you don't. It, it's it's part of the STS, so I'm not even doing anything to generate uh, these diagrams. As soon as you create a new Spring integration file, the diagrams are generated uh, right behind you. So, for example, I want to create. Um, Service Activator, um, right? So all I did is type it in, and then go to the diagram, and it connected, it created the channel. Cha the channel was already there, and now it, you see the Service Activator, and they're connected because, um, I'm sorry, because uh, I said that the, the input channel, this input channel, this channel is an input channel of the Service Activator, all right? All right, um, next question. In the retry demo, what would you do to limit the number of retries? Well, I think I kind of went through that. So um, in my particular use case, I mean, again, all these use cases are kind of trivial. So in my particular use case, the limit was kind of implied because I'm saying, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting a string, and a string should be four characters long. So I knew that if I send an empty string, it could be at most as five retries. If I send a string with one character, it could be at most as four retries. And remember when I sent uh, four characters, it was only one retry. But you can, of course, um, you know, build a more complex and more sophisticated logic where you, know, you can pass um, a message header. You can have a message header that says, okay, well, retry this thing five times, or retry this thing 10 times, or you know, determine the value of a retry dynamically, and then this particular, uh, let me go back to the code. Then this particular um, component, for example, that you know, the, that the uppercase or in our case, would instead of, for example, you would change the code to you know, get the headers uh, from uh, into this particular method, and then you'd be looking into the header and say, listen, how many times I should retry it, and, and kind of increase the counter every time. And by the time, and you know, at some point of time, you'll say, well. It should be retried five times. It's been retried five times, so I'm just going to exit. So um, how can one decide when to use a channel adapter versus gateway, except directional properties? Are there any other design considerations? Um, 
No. Well, f first of all, for example, when it comes to uh, adapters are mostly actually in the gateway. So the gateway I was showing you it was kind of a unique case because our, this particular gateway is just a gateway sort of a, from your Java code into the messaging system. So it actually um, handles kind of, a, like I said, it's an exceptional case. It handles both unidirectional and bidirectional. But the, the other gateways uh, and adapters are usually specific to uh, remote systems, like for example, HTTP adapter, I mean, I'm sorry, HTTP gateway versus uh, GM, um, versus let's say FTP adapter. So, like, so for example, we don't have HTTP adapter, we only have HTTP gateway, because if you think about it, when you're dealing with HTTP, you, you kind of have to uh, inherit the characteristics of the protocol that you're dealing with. And uh, HTTP protocol is inherently, you know, request reply. So there's no, con there's no reason to um, have an adapter because even if you're not interested in reply, reply will always come. So that's based on the protocol. Where in FTP, there's no such a thing as, um, actually we have both. We have a condition where you want to execute a command in FTP and get a reply back or you just want to upload the file and be done with it. So we have FTP adapters and gateways, right? So I hope that kind of helps. So in other words, and if we don't have an adapter, like there's, like, like, like for example, an HTTP, that just simply means that this particular protocol is not, you know, suited for creating a unidirectional flow. It kind of gives you a little bit of a hint as to um, can you, can you not do something. In the upper limit to the timeout, parameter of how to handle the process that takes long times, like one hour, um, well, then you would say your timeout is going to be, you know, one and a half hour. I mean, that's uh, that's actually one of the reasons why we don't have um, a default timeout. And in fact, there was a, quite a lot of discussions internally about this span over a couple of years. And we all decided that, you know, if you, if you, um, I believe everything, there's no way we can come up with some reasonable default value. So um, that's what I would just say. I mean, if, if, if you expect it for an hour, then, you know, make your timeout reasonable to your expectations. Uh, will code samples be available? Yes, they're available, and I showed it to you earlier. Um, can you please, please exception using chain? Yeah. Uh, how, do you use how do you use control bus to modify the runtime messaging components? Uh, this actually uh, a good question, and although it is unrelated to um, this particular presentation, to this particular webinar, uh, Gary Russell, one of the developers of Spring Integration, will actually be doing a webinar showing you exactly that in about, you know, um, sometime in June. So um, you'll see the announcement. Uh, it's going to be basically uh, managing and uh, monitoring and, and um, Managing and monitoring Spring Integration applications, so it's going to be Control Bus, Spring Insight, and all other things for Spring Integration. Uh, why aren't you a fan of chains? Um, <laughs> just I, I don't know. I, I, I'll skip that question. Just uh, we can talk about it later. Um, is it possible to have the, your own ID generator used only for a specific component rather than globally? Well, what component? There's only one component. It's message. Uh, so that's. Um, ID generator is used just for messages, so it's, it, it only handles specific components. It's not for anything else. In a self-healing like, in a self-healing demo, I didn't see a declaration of a processing channel. Can't see the code right now, of course. Could you clarify? Well, the declaration. So if I don't declare the, so in Spring integration, it's a convention. In Spring integration, if we see the input channel, but that if, if we see a component that, that has an input channel attribute, but there is no explicit declaration for the input channel, we ought to create default um, um, direct channel. So that's why um, you can see, we can, because the direct channels, they're basically a default channels, they have no properties, and uh, putting them explicitly in XML is just a noise because it's really not necessary and we can create them for you. So that's the answer. Um, could you compare Spring Integration versus Camel? Could you refer to any webinars, Docs? Um, this is actually an interesting question and actually being asked in the previous webinar. And uh, there's actually a um, couple of, you can do some research on the web, the like Google around. Uh, there is a couple of um, um, blogs recently came out and I can probably, if you ask this question in the forum, I can probably point out, uh, provide you with the links. Um, Camel and Spring Integration, uh, yes, there are two frameworks. Uh, there are two frameworks. Two, two, appro two, two framework approaches to handle enterprise integration patterns, right? So we, we're not ESB, we're frameworks, but we approach enterprise integration patterns in 
you know, very radically different ways. So, um, and again, the comparison from me uh, would be kind of a bias. So um, I can try to be as objective as I can, but I cannot do it in you know 30 seconds. So, uh, like I said, if you ask this question on the forum, I'll be more than glad to provide a few pointers and provide you with the links. We had developed a huge application based on Spring integration, and it was a pleasant experience. But we ran into problems during develop development when attempting to debug. Are there any best practices for debugging? Again, um, I can share, for example, what we do because we actually our test case, our test base is like but our ratio from test to production code is three to one. So we have three times more test cases than uh, our production code. So I can definitely share what we do while developing the project, but then again, it's uh, not a 30 second answer. Um, best practice for number of retries. I had to use a prototype beam to do that. Uh, there's main, again, it should be specific to the use case. I need to know what your requirement are, and then we can come up with the best practice. Um, um, have you run this as OSGI bundle in something like server, server mix? Um, I actually came to Spring Source as sort of a, an OSGI person, and I worked on Spring DM and so on. I'm not a big fan of OSGI today, so uh, yes, Spring integration, currently every jar file, distribution jar file is a, is a bundle, is a valid OSGI bundle. It comes, it comes with the manifest, so it's possible, and I did it before, but that's pretty much, um, I, like I said, I'm not a big fan of OSGI. But actually, I presented Spring Integration with OSGI at Spring 1, 2000, 2009, or 10. So, um, uh, the schedule that you mentioned in the tutorial, is, Java, is it Java-based schedule, or are you using something like Quartz? Um, it's based on the um, scheduling framework that, basically, it's based on the scheduling support provided by Spring. So, uh, I'll quickly show you, I guess I skipped that part. Um, where is our retry? So, um, Basically, here's my, it comes from a task namespace, here's my schedule, so I'm creating a pool size of 10. And, but yes, there's also support for Quartz in Spring. So you can actually override and create a, a Quartz scheduler, and from Spring integration, it would be the same configuration, which was just using a different scheduler. On the aggregator demo, was the error channel actually routed to the aggregator, or was there some implicit uh, release due to handling the error condition? So let's look. Um, uh, where is my arrow? Right here. So again, it, the transformer receives the transforming error channel, and as you can see, to answer your question, the, this transformer, once it modifies the message, it routes to the aggregation channel, and um, the process repeats. Uh, so, there's nothing implicit. We don't really do much with magic there. It's just uh, you can follow everything by basically pairing up input and output channels. Spring, does Spring integration explicitly handle transaction capability? The answer is yes, and um, I'll try to cover it in a future webinar, but um, we basically rely uh, on the Spring transactional support, which, uh, in other words, if you already have a Spr if, you're, if you're already using Spring and you have a transactional component, then um, then Spring uh, integration will execute it on a transaction because everything that you see, all these components, are still Spring beans. So in other words, it basically is the same as uh, using raw Spring. It's just that we're hiding the complexity of the endpoint configuration behind the namespaces. Which book do you suggest for exclusive for Spring integration? Um, well, our free um, uh, documentation provided by Spring integration, you can get it from um, our homepage, and also um, uh, Josh Long has written a uh, book, Spring Integration Recipes. I would suggest to read that. Again, guys, seriously, can, like, here's a question. Can you throw some light into the best practices of configuring outbound gateway timeouts? Um, it's, um, you have to, it's specific to your use case. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know how your system works. So there's no, there's no golden rule, and that's, that, that's the reason why we don't have a default timeout, because, you know, if I say, Five minutes, is it, is it good enough? I mean, it might be good enough for a certain category of people. It might not be good enough for other category of people. And it means I'm ha making somebody happy, making somebody unhappy. So uh, you, it's, that's why we expose this attribute, and that's why it doesn't have a default value because of this particular problem. Can you talk about custom sequencing the messages for high throughput, high transaction system? Actually, sequencing and resequencing is going to be covered in the part two of this webinar. So join me in uh, May 3. I believe. Um, 
I've seen the cases where default timeout was not enforced on the gateway. What seemed to work was defining the gateway method and putting the timeout on that level. Is this a common result in misconfiguration? Well, uh, I would love to see that configuration that because if, if what you're describing is true, that would be a bug. But I, like I said, I would have to see it first because I've never seen this case uh, myself. Would you recommend inserting a gateway just for error handling routines? Well, that's a great question. Um, so that's exactly what I did because, for example, if you look at my um, segmentation demo, right, I could, you know, I could remove all these guys. I mean, I can remove all these gateways and just simply send to the service activators. And I already, you know, all the exceptions would be handled by this gateway. So, but um, if, if I want to wrap some piece of, uh, if I want to wrap like sort of a wrap a block of code saying, listen, I want this block of code, this, blo this block of handlers or this chain in a way to, to handle its own, um, to handle its own errors, then yeah, by all means, that's what you would do. We've run into a problem losing the original error context in getting bird nested. So when using Spring and JMS and exception handlers, this seems a similar pattern to what you're doing, but we get a JMS exception in that handler. Again, I'll be more than glad to help you if you can provide me with, you know, a lot of times what people do on the forums, if they can, you know, isolate examples, a very simple configuration and very simple, you know, uh, test case and zip it up and attach it in the forum, you know, we'll be more than glad to actually attempt to reproduce it. And that's actually how you guys contribute to the project because your feedback is absolutely necessary. And uh, I, I believe this is a very interesting question. I just can't answer it right now until I get more details. For error handling, is everything driven off the setting the error channel parameter on the gateway? Does the error channel cascade down to all the message endpoints that occur after that? Well, that's what I was explaining from the very beginning. That would make no sense if that, would, if that were to happen because it would be the same as if you picture the try catch block and five lines of code in the side of this try catch block and each line of code would be wrapped in its own try and catch block. That's essentially, I believe, what you're describing. So, no, it should not be proper. It, it, it's not propagated. It should not be propagated. And that's why we don't define error channels on service activator transformers and filters and so on. We only define error channels on the entry point into the messaging flow. It also, HTTP outbound gateway, it appears that the timeout is not respected. We need to set it, first of all, um, we need to set it on the connection factory in order for the timeout to be respected. Is this as designed? Well, there's actually, again, uh, it's, uh, there's, there's more than, there's, I need like at least 10 minutes to answer this question. There's, there's a lot of interesting things to say about that. So again, perfect question for the forum, please ask it. How to perform load test or write test cases for complete integration for spring integration? Um, well, I, just like you would complete, it, it, again, it, the spring integration um, is the same, the spring integration uh, test case is the same as any other test case because if you look at uh, any one of our examples or try demo, I mean, from, the, from this particular code, it's, it doesn't even look like Spring integration, right? So it's pure Java code. If I want a performance test this bean, I would just simply put a stopwatch. I would start it right here and I would end it right here and I would say, okay, well, that's how long it, will, it took to execute. So that's actually one of the beauties of the gateways. It gives you the capability of saying, I'm gonna not worry about the messaging. That's gonna be done through configuration. I'm only, I'm, I'm gonna expose it as a plain old Java bean and interact with it as a plain old Java bean. Can a timeout get exponentially larger? I mean, um, like one, two, to four seconds. Um, I, I'm assuming you mean dynamically, like um, if, through JMX you can reset the timeouts. And uh, again, Gary will probably cover that. I'll actually pass, off, pass on this question to him. Um, can you have a derived value for a timeout? Um, not a number, but from some data. Well, timeout can only be a number, so I'm not sure what that means. Each channel has priority, which message to execute first? Yeah, we have, we have a priority channel in Spring Integration. Again, Mark uh, covers it in his webinar. Um, just some curiosity, can Spring Integration be an alternative to Mule ESB? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's as much as 
I'm willing to say right now without starting or picking, you know. Um, does Spring Integration support IBM MQ connection retry? Um, it's not Spring Integration's responsibility to support that. That's provided by uh, IBM MQ, and we provide, and Spring provides JMS support that works perfectly fine with IBM MQ uh, connection factory. So uh, that's not even something that we really need to do. Um, can you register multiple AD generators? Uh, I don't understand why would you want to register multiple AD generators, and the AD generator do not have ID by itself, uh, because we're not using it, we know, nobody's referencing to it, so it doesn't really have to have an ID. Um, what is the need to generate a message ID? Uh, to answer this question, you, I would suggest to read uh, Enterprise Integration Patterns book, uh, because it's really at the core of uh, identifying that each message within the messaging system is always unique and always immutable. So in other words, every time the, you send a message to a handler and this handler produces a result based on this message, it's a whole new message. So it's based on the mutability concept, and that's at the very core of the messaging architecture. Uh, so the bootstrap question, the guy, uh, thanks for coming back. Um, so the bootstrap gateway question referred to the sample that you had where there was multiple gateways. For our application, we typically have only one gateway. And that's what most applications have, and that's, what I, that's why I showed you the sample to actually demonstrate that you guys can have multiple gateways. But you, oh, the only reason for you to do that would be if you want partition or segment your flow to be able to handle um, error, uh, to, to, to have individual error handling for each particular uh, segment within your flow. So in other words, you will have uh, the main gateway that identifies the main entry point into your entire messaging flow, and then within that messaging flow, you'll create sort of these partitions that have its own sort of isolated scope for error handling. What are the performance impacts of Spring Integration if we don't use um, Task Executor? Well, uh, again, this is a very vague question. I mean, there's no performance uh, implication until, you know, most of the performance issues, actually, guys, are coming from the developers. So, uh, like, a result of, of the developers doing something wrong with their code or configuration. So, uh, again, if you, by simply distributing the process, you, it, that doesn't mean that the process is going to become faster or slower. Uh, in fact, concurrency can sometimes slow down your process instead of speed it up. So, it all depends on what you do, how you do. So, um, again, I need more details to uh, answer that. Um, um, all the messages in SI have to implement serializable, can be any type. No, none of them have to be serializable. And uh, yeah, the message, um, by definition, and again, it's not even the spring integration, it's by definition the enterprise integration patterns. Message is a very simple object. It contains a, a payload, which is of type object, which means it could be any type, and headers, which is of type message headers, which is basically an extension of map which could be, uh, with, and the map is string to object, which means you can put anything in the headers as well. So, but you have to realize that as soon as, so while, while executing this message, uh, messaging flow within um, a single JVM, there's obviously no serialization is occurring, but when you try to deal with, adapt, with remote adapters and gateways, there's gonna be element of serialization um, that we required there, and those adapters actually do define uh, transformers and serializers um, according to their protocol specifications. What if my service activator called by the gateway return that gateway returns void? How do we better handle the scenario without overhead of a gateway timeout? Um, why would you say that? Uh, I'm not. To I, don't, I don't understand that. Um, I don't understand why the timeout is an overhead. You're basically saying you define a method. That where you, where you declare that you are expecting the reply, right? Because by defining a non-void method, you're essentially declaring, I'm going to call this method with this value, and I am expecting a reply. But since you're expecting a reply, you also, you'll, the timeout allows you to tell me how long are you willing to wait for your reply. So, um, so I'm not really sure how to answer that other than just kind of re-explaining what I just said. And actually, I went through all the questions. So, and... Um, now I'm gonna go back to this slide and uh, finish off while you guys are looking at this slide deck. So um, once again, uh, I want to thank you all for joining. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you do, I hope to see you back uh, at uh, on um, May 3, where we're gonna be doing part three, 
And part three is going to be actually very interesting because it's going to cover some of the um, advanced cases for aggregation and resequencing um, and other interesting things. So um, I'll try to even uh, update the agenda of what's going to be covered uh, shortly. But once again, thank you very much, and um, have a great day, and uh, hope to see you again.